Welcome to the Two-Wheel Revolution on uh, thinktechhawaii.com, where we talk about personal mobility. We talk about bikes, e-bikes, uh, e-scooters, e-skateboards, and the personal mobility original uh, walking. And um, I'm your host, Peter Rossig. Uh, thank you for joining us. Stick around because I think it's going to be a very interesting half hour. And at the end of it, we're going to have a micro mobility moment, which I hope will be fun and amusing. So uh, recently, a very nice thing happened. Uh, the uh, the engineering advisory engineers advisory council of the Hawaii Tourism and Lodging Association uh, donated money and uh, helped to uh, put together sixty new bikes for the Hawaii Bicycling League's uh, bike education program. And uh, we have uh, we're going to talk to a member of the Engineer Advisory Council today, Harzali Hashim, and he's uh, Complex Director of Engineering for the Kyoya Hotels and uh, Resorts. So, and we're going to talk to one of the bicycle educators for the Hawaii Bicycling League, Malia Harunaga. So, uh, I have uh, Harzali, welcome, and uh, thanks for joining us. No problem. Thank you, Peter. All right, because I have a kind of an unusual name, I'm always curious about uh, names. So can I ask you about what kind of name is Harzali Hashim? Uh, you can. It's actually from Malaysia. My parents were born and raised in, in Malaysia, immigrated to Australia and, and had me over there. And uh, uh, H-A-R are actually my dad's initials. So it's kind of a bit of a made up, made up name. So yeah, a little right. bit original. Uh, you sound like an Australian, though, so that's, uh, I can sometimes tell Australians from New Zealanders, but not always. So tell us briefly about your job. What do you do uh, for Curia for Sheridan? Well, I'm the Complex Director of Engineering here for the Curia Hotels and Resorts. So that takes, uh, encompasses the four hotels here in Waikiki, which is the Sheraton Waikiki, the Royal Hawaiian, the Moana Surf Rider, and the Princess Kailani Hotels. Uh, it also includes the Sheraton Maui, and the palace in San Francisco. So I help and support the directors of engineering at each of those hotels uh, in order to maintain the facilities and um, any kind of sustainability efforts uh, that they uh, I used to work for Hawaiian Electric, and I know Sheraton uh, here in Hawaii especially, but uh, has a very strong reputation for environment, uh, sustainability, ecological management. I, I, I'm guessing that comes down to you. Yeah, correct. Uh, when we were Starwood previously, and, and now we were have been bought over by Marriott, uh, both of those organizations have very robust uh, sustainability plans uh, in place where we have certain goals that we need to meet each year, and then an end goal for Marriott is in 20, 2050. Yeah. Great. So tell us about the, the Engineers Advisory Council. I'm guessing most people have heard of the Hawaii Tourism and Lodging Association, which is led by MUFI. Hanneman, but I don't think many people probably realize there's uh, your, anything about your council. So can you tell us briefly about that? Yeah, uh, Engineers Advisory Council is kind of an offshoot part, little part of the Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association, but kind of an offshoot where we specialize more in the facilities engineers. So it's a, it's a group of engineers from all of the hotels here on Oahu. Each, each uh, island has their own has their own membership, but um, Engineers Advisory Council is, is just specific to, to Oahu. Uh, membership, membership, again, consists of uh, engineers from the different hotels, uh, both in Waikiki as well as out, out in Olina or even the North Shore uh, and Turtle Bay. Um, right. uh, in 2018, we did in encompass some allied members, which uh, take um, encompass our vendors and contractors as well to boost our membership. Great. So how did your group decide to donate uh, a pretty substantial amount of money and your own time and, and energy to uh, the Hawaii Bicycling League? Well, every year we like to do some kind of community service event. Uh, in the past, we had installed AC units at Jefferson Elementary uh, and also built a stage for Kaiser High School. So we were looking for something to do that was centered around sustainability, something that would, would be uh, kind of a quick hit where we could instant, instantly see uh, the fruits of our labor. So we thought bike donation would have been was was good, and we were going to do it just to one school. Uh, but when one of our members found the uh, Hawaii Bicycling League and, and Bike Ed, we thought, well, what better way to 
to spread the wealth to many kids rather than just one school. All right. And while you're talking about it, we have some pictures uh, we can show you. You had a big turnout uh, at the uh, last, it's very recent, last Saturday uh, as we speak. And and uh, that pe people seem to be having a good time. Uh, uh, was it fun? It, it, it was fun. I mean, nobody likes getting up early on a Saturday. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but it was fun. We had about 30 to 35 people out there and uh, everybody was there just because they wanted to be there for a good cause and put together some bikes and, and get some kids that, that don't know how to ride or, or don't have access to a bike um, on, on, on two wheels. Uh, oh, that, we that's true. Yeah, we kept it fun and interesting. We gave away raffles. We fed people. So everybody was uh, fully engaged. All right. That last picture was uh, kind of the group at the end and yep. everybody seemed to be uh glad glad to be done so um and i should say that the at the end uh after the assembly the uh they didn't just throw away the the other bikes the the old bikes that were had been part of the education program uh were donated to what's called k vibe here's a picture of the donation to Kalihi valley instructional bike exchange where they teach kids to uh actually fix and assemble bikes and repair bikes and uh, to the, the Hawaii Boys and Girls Club. So uh, all together, uh, you, you've touched a lot of people with this. And, and, uh, and also there were helmets provided courtesy of the Hawaii uh, State Department of, of Health. So, uh, you know, I, I personally want to congratulate you guys and, and uh, I'm sure you've been thanked, but I think we should thank you again. And thank you for, for coming out to, uh, to talk to us about it. Okay. Uh, thank you again to Harzali Hashim from uh, Kyoya, who was uh, part of the Engineering Council. And now we're going to talk to Malia Harunaga, who is uh, one of the uh, bike education uh, people for Hawaii uh, Bicycling League. Uh, welcome, uh, Malia. And, and uh, you tell us a little bit about yourself, how long you've been with the Bicycling League, things like that. Sure, yeah. Um, I am the Director of Adult Education with the Hawaii Bicycling League. I've been with HBL um, teaching for them for the past 10 years, and I've been in this position for the past eight years. So you started when you were eight? Uh, <laughs> uh, 12, 12, 12, okay. Started right out of college. Um, uh, okay. I was going to UH Manoa, and walking seemed to take forever, so my dad built me up a bike from a bunch of parts. I zoomed down St. Louis Heights, was at uh, class in no time at all and really fell into love with biking, I think, from that point on. Let's look at the big picture. Tell us a little bit about the whole HBL uh, education effort, which includes you. And, and I know uh, we couldn't get your companion, Taylor Clark, on the show today, but we will try for another time. But what's the HBL's position on education? Sure. So um, why bicycle mission? incorporate education as one of its pillars. So we have advocacy, education, and events. We know that education is really important, everything from Kiki to Kupuna, and so that's who we serve the entire um, island of Oahu. Uh, we have a very popular and I would say well-known program that is our Bike Ed Hawaii program that teaches uh, fourth graders across the state and has been going on since 1989. It teaches about 8,000 oh. kids each year um, and then we have educational programs. These are both funded through grants from the city and county of Honolulu Department of Transportation Services. And they allow us to go out and bring um, a box truck full of bikes to the different schools around the island. Um, we also have adult education program, which is uh, what I manage. And that is everything from teaching adults how to ride a bike for the very first time to those that have a bike, but they're not feeling comfortable or you know having a good time when they're riding on the street. We get them set up with the skills and the knowledge to make sure that they have an enjoyable ride every time they go out, um, whether it's using bike infrastructure, riding on the street, or you know, even in their residential neighborhoods. Um, we also have maintenance classes, uh, hands-on and on bike, where we go over um, how to climb hills uh, and really just making the ride more enjoyable and welcoming for every level of cyclist. Um, we're going to be relaunching our senior cycling program that features recumbent tricycles. Um, and that program will be our Golden Gears program, where we actually let folks use our 
14 recumbent tricyclists to ride on the Pearl Harbor bike path where there's no cars. Um, it's a really great way to explore the island, uh, find something that is fun and social and healthy uh, on the three wheels, super stable. And um, that's going to be uh, really something I'm looking forward to. Okay. Can I sign up for that right now? <laughs> you can. Okay. You can on our website. <laughs> Put me, oh, I got to go to the website. I thought you'd take care of me right here on uh, on Think Tech. Uh, so, uh, but see, you know, seems to me most people or many people learn to ride bikes when they're kids uh, and uh, with all the whatever bad habits that brings along. So uh, trying to teach adults must be particularly challenging, I would think. Um, yeah, it's definitely a, a wonderful skill to have as a uh, a child riding a bike, you know, getting to see your friends, going to the park, giving your sense that sense of freedom and exploration. Um, and that's one of the reasons that our bike ed program that teaches fourth grade is really crucial. Um, it sets them up with those skills, whether they know how to ride or not, and make sure that they know how to ride properly in their neighborhoods. For those that maybe didn't get to experience bike ed um, in their younger years or have never been on a bike in their life, or maybe it's been a long time, um, that's where our adult learn to ride program comes in. And it's pretty wonderful. Um, we just recently had a class on Sunday, uh, seven participants and 100% success rate. So folks that had um, never been on a bike or maybe when they were five and now they're 55 coming out and seeing, okay, do, can I balance? What does this take? Um, and it just takes an instructor to kind of be there to guide them and also serve as their personal cheerleader, just encouraging them, you know, you're here at this workshop, you wanna learn, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. Um, and we use techniques that are really safe um, and comfortable for novice first time writers. We always, um, we're, we're very encouraging and we never push somebody to do something that they don't feel comfortable with. And we start well, nice where, where would you do something like this where you could be safe and, the, and your, your uh, students would feel secure and, and not have to worry about, running into things. Sure, yeah, definitely if you're learning how to ride, you don't wanna have anybody else around you, especially cars. So we use the Alawai Promenade, which is a multi-use bike path. Um, yeah. It's kind of a little tucked away gem that I feel like not too many people know about, um, but it serves for a great learning space. All right, uh, so we should say, as you mentioned before, uh, there's a lot of information about both Bike Ed and, uh, and Adult Biking on the website, hbl.org, and opportunities for people to sign up. Uh, I don't know if this, I know this isn't your, your main area, but if I were a teacher uh, or a parent of uh, a fourth grader, how would I get involved with Bike Ed? That's a great question. Um, so our Bike Ed calendar is usually full um, and set a year in advance, just because of the wow. high demand. We've been going on since 1989, so the schools that have, already been in the program. They like to keep their certain dates. Um, wow. So it is, uh, it's not impossible to get another school in, but we do cover at least a hundred schools on the island. Um, wow. And so it ultimately comes down to the principal, but if you go and just chat with the fourth grade instructor um, and you're a parent, you can even have the opportunity to come out and volunteer uh, when your child is going through bike ed for that five day instruction. All right. And what about the adult bike, Ed? You you, you said, and I, I know from my own experience, that having a, uh, somebody there to boost your uh, your uh, confidence and to keep you on, keep you from falling over at the beginning is very important. Is it all HBL folks or do you have volunteers turn out for that as well? Yeah. Um, so all of our cycling workshops are uh, put on by our league cycling in instructors. They are certified nationally. They've gone through um, a 23-hour seminar um, and have been nationally certified by the League of American Bicyclists to teach the curriculum, to teach the material, to lead adults out into potentially traffic safely. So we do um, employ our LCIs, um, but there's always opportunities you know, for people to come by and help out, um, whether or not it's just getting the bikes ready because um, we do provide the bikes for the students for the Adult Learn to Ride program. Um, for the Golden Gears Trike program, um, we're always looking for ride along programs. Right? <laughs> um, Gears, totally. Yeah. yeah, so uh, for those that might want to just come out and, and assist with the ride, make sure everybody's feeling good, drinking their water, um, that is available as far as um, 
right along helpers uh, that want to volunteer. So I'm sure you know that from the point of view of, of people who are not avid cyclists, from the point of view of drivers and pedestrians, uh, there, there's always a certain kind of uh, you know, nervousness about cyclists, especially, uh, you know, the, the, there are people out on their fixies and, or, you know, we don't have a big bike messenger problem here, but uh, there's always a concern that people are going to be hot dogging, that people are going to ride out from between cars or they're going to, you know, be coming down the street and on the sidewalk at, at gazillion of miles per hour. And especially for senior citizens, I think there's always, you know, you're thinking, now oh, somebody's going to knock me over. And especially now with, with electric bikes. So how do you deal with that when you're trying to educate people uh, on, on how to ride well? Sure. So that's definitely a big concern. We love seeing people riding. We want to see more people riding, but we need to all play together safely um, folks need to know what the rules of the road are, but then they also need to follow them. So having our educational workshops that go over, you know, what are the, the laws that govern cyclists? Why is it so important to follow them is really crucial. Um, one thing that we really emphasize is that, you know, when you're riding a bicycle, you are operating a vehicle. So you want to make sure that you're abiding by those same practices or anything that would um, you know, a motor vehicle operator would be doing. So stopping at the red lights, hopefully, stopping at stop signs, yielding to pedestrians. That's all things that um, a vehicle operator, like a bicycle operator, should be doing. Um, the other thing that we like to tell people is that um, cyclists fare best when they act and are treated as drivers of vehicles. So understanding, you know, what, um, what you should be doing on the road uh, giving yourself that space that you deserve, that, that's crucial um, to not only having a safe ride, but an enjoyable ride. Uh, for drivers, it's you really... Know, that's, that's the question. The <laughs> next question, obviously, is uh, even if all the bicyclists were great, which they're not, but they're getting there, uh, what do we do about drivers uh, and how do we reach them and give them the, uh, you know, the sense of, of the, what we need for safety for everybody? For, for drivers, it's really um, making sure that they know kind of what's going on in the mind of a cyclist. So we'll do presentations to uh, different groups or businesses to let them know, again, what are the laws so that they know, oh, this cyclist is not riding in the middle of the, of the lane to purposely make me late for work. That That's somewhere that's actually, they're doing me a favor by being more visible, making sure that I know where they are. They're giving me control as a driver. So helping them understand kind of what the mentality might be uh, with somebody riding on a two-wheel bicycle that's solely human powered, dealing with, you know, the forces of nature, wind, a little bit of uphill can really make the going feel a little tough. Um, and that's easy to forget when we're, you know, in a car with the windows up, AC on, music on, right? Um, right. So just kind of having some compassion, but letting them know that you know, we're all people, right? We're all humans. It's this person that's driving cars, this person that's uh, riding their bicycle. And it all kind of should boil down to us being humanly and taking care of each other, looking out for each other is really important. Yeah, you know, when I, many of us have had the experience of being in Europe in a city like Copenhagen or Amsterdam and seeing, uh, you know, the interaction of, of cars and bicycles. And it just occurs to me that in this, you know, and then that didn't develop overnight. It took those cities many, many years to become as bike friendly as they are. Uh, but it, it seems to me that every driver has probably been a bicyclist, has got parents or siblings or uh, spouses or kids who are bicycling. And so they have, based on their own experience, a reason to be uh, aware of the of the cyclists around them. And it's not perfect. They, I imagine I, in those cities, the drivers are probably even more agitated some days because there's so many bicycles. But it seems to me that, you know, over time, you can, we need to develop that kind of attitude where everybody respects uh, the cyclists and every cyclist respects their drivers because we're all, as you say, humans in it together. Totally. Yeah. The more people that are on bicycles, the safer and better it will be not only for bicyclists, but for everybody. We know that bike infrastructure helps pedestrians. Um, it can help the safety of drivers too. So we're definitely all for getting people out of their cars. Um, nobody likes sitting in traffic, right? 
Um, and if we were to think about every person that had the bicycle, if they also have a car to, to say, forget biking, I had too many close calls, I'm gonna just drive. Is that a future that we would want? I would think not. Um, you know, health would go down, the environment would be heavily impacted. So having people understand that, you know, people are riding bikes, it could be because that's all they could afford. Um, it could be that they're trying to, you know, uh, work on their diabetes um, or lose weight. Uh, or it could just be, you know, they're conscious about how much pollutants that, you know, cars put out. And this is a small island. Um, we can travel by bicycle. We just need to get the bike infrastructure and have people see each other biking out there and, you know, realize, oh, that's my neighbor down the road. I, you know, just bring everybody together like that. Okay, so you're you're a frequent regular bike rider, and I'm sure you uh, have seen uh, in the last couple of years, first of all, the bike infrastructure has improved with more bike lanes, but we also see more different vehicles. We see one wheel uh, electric kind of unicycles. We see uh, electric bicycles. We see three wheelers. Uh, we see four wheel uh, skateboards that are, uh, or even one wheel skateboards. There's a whole variety of different kinds of vehicles increasing in number. Some are electric powered, some are human powered, uh, and they have different speeds. And uh, so I'm, how are we gonna deal with this uh, variety of things? I mean, it was one thing when it was just human powered bicycles, of course, some were faster than others, but uh, there were certain kind of built in limits, but now those limits seem to be going away. So how do we deal with this potential conflict? That's a that's a really good question. I think right now um, it's uh, difficult because there's not definitions yet in place. There's not policies set by the city um, of Honolulu, by the state of Hawaii yet. Just recently, they incorporated one class of e-bikes, class one, um, being under 20 miles per hour, one horsepower, um, 750 watts, uh, to be considered a bicycle that they need to register, just like any other bike um, that's ridden here uh, in Honolulu. Um, I think the definitions need to be set first. Uh, I think micromobility is great. Again, getting people out of cars, giving them an option to not have to drive their car to work or to run an errand um, is, is really important. We don't wanna lose that, um, but we do need to make sure that everybody is playing well together, especially if we're all gonna be using the bike lanes, which we know that there's not too many of them. So we're all gonna be sharing them. So how can we do that best and share them together um, with Aloha, be courteous. It doesn't really uh, you know, matter what wheels you're riding, as long as we can ride together and not, you know, crash into each, into each other and, um, you know, we, we should be courteous and we should understand that, hey, at least that's one less person in the car. That's exactly right. One less person in who might be in a car. So what does the HBL need? Uh, you know, I, I sometimes ask a blank check question. If I could give you a blank check uh, for whatever you would want to improve the bike uh, education program, expand it, whatever, what would what is HBL looking for to keep this going and to expand it? How much time do you have now? <laughs> Just, <laughs> not um... much. We got about a minute <laughs> left, so uh, not too much. Yeah, so, um, you know, any kind, of, <laughs> any kind of funding would be um, surely welcome here. Um, our bike ed program, we just got that wonderful donation of bikes to replace our uh, two fleets of, of bikes, but we need to replace the vehicle that transports them. So we have two box trucks. That is a huge, uh, huge thing. Our instructors can't ride all 60 bikes over to all of the schools across the island. So we do need right. a vehicle. That's what we're looking for, um, as well as um, looking for some support for the Golden Gears uh, trike program um, okay. that, you know, we could get a vehicle to bring them around to different locations um, if somebody is not able to get to the Pearl City area. Um, and then just general funding for adult education. I mean, I would love to see everybody that came to one of our classes be able to, you know, uh, use a bike that we provide, you know, for no cost. Because mm. right now they have to bring a bike for most of the workshops. And I really think that if you are able to get a driver or somebody who hasn't been on a bike in a while on a bicycle on the streets of Honolulu, it will open their eyes um, right. to, you know, the challenges that uh, may come about, but also the fun that biking brings um, and hopefully kind of just 
gets them excited to uh, to ride and to be careful looking out for other people um, on the road because they understand a little bit more uh, what goes on <laughs> the road. Okay, okay, that blank check is in the mail. I don't don't hold your breath, but uh, we have a, a good sense of what HBL, which is doing in my mind great work. Malia, thank you very, very much. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to, uh, you're welcome to stay and watch this little little bit. Here's the, uh, the micro mobility moment that I promised with the picture that I took. Well, I didn't take it, okay. Mm -hmm. it 1886 in Capulani Park. You can see Diamond Head in the background. Uh, Capulani Park was then a, a racetrack. And here's a, a guy out on the uh, on his penny farthing, which was one of the, the earliest bikes. And I just think that's remarkable, 1886. But this is not one of the earliest mentions or signs of bicycles in Hawaii. Uh, I, there's a brief verse I'm going to read from the Hawaiian Gazette, July 21st, 1869. And the verse is called Velocipede, which is the old name for bicycle, Velocipede. And so I'm going to read this poem, uh, and it goes like this. The shades of night were coming down as swiftly racing through the town. A youth whose strength could scarce suffice to keep him on that strange device, Velocipede. So that's the micro mobility moment. Uh, thank you, Malia. Thank you, Harzali. Uh, thanks to you, uh, the listeners, for staying with us on the Two Wheel Revolution on thinktechhawaii.com. We'll be back in two weeks with a new show. And you can catch uh, this one again. If you had such a good time, you can watch this one again or see the old ones on YouTube, Vimeo, and uh, many other fine platforms. Thank you very much for being with us and have a great week. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.